it's uh, our big pleasure to welcome Professor Bernard Carr, uh, who is Professor of uh, Mathematics and Astronomy at uh, Queen Mary University of London. Uh, he is a uh, research, he is a prominent scientist, and his research covers uh, studies of early universe, dark matter, general relativity, primordial black holes, and um, anthropic principles. So this is also um, very exciting. Um, he is an uh, author of many uh, highly cited papers and monographs, and uh, some of them were awarded by international awards. Um, uh, it's interesting uh, also to mention that he completed his uh, bachelor uh, thesis in mathematics in 1972 at Trinity College, and for his doctorate he worked, uh, uh, he studied relativity and cosmology under Stephen Hawking uh, at the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge. Uh, of course, uh, Professor uh, Carr is uh, highly welcome at many uh, universities and research institutes all over the world, and uh, he's a giant professor and uh, visitor and so on. And, uh, I learned today that he already has been at Lebedev uh, Institute many, many years ago, maybe in the early 80s, maybe in uh, so there is still some uncertainty in this issue, but anyway, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome you again here and uh, to hear your public lecture, uh, which, uh, which concerns primordial black holes after uh, 50 years. Let's us welcome you. Well, thank you very much. It is a great honor to be here, and I think my first visit to the Lebanon Institute was in 1973 when I came here with Stephen Hawking and I visited Moscow again in, in 1982, the second quantum gravity conference, but it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here again. Um, and I want to talk about a topic which has been close in my heart for nearly 50 years. It's a topic which actually begun in, in Russia, as I will explain, the study of primordial black holes. And, and it's Primordial black holes are black holes that formed in the early universe. So this is the, um, the, the a standard picture of the, of the Big Bang going from the Big Bang to late times. And the point about this diagram is that the primordial black holes are the black holes that actually formed in the um, very first seconds of the universe. And I have to make it clear at the outset, we still don't know for sure that those black holes actually exist. But nevertheless, there's a currently a lot of excitement about this possibility, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And another theme of my talk, if I have time to get onto it, is why I think primordial black holes are so interesting, because they make a link between microphysics and macrophysics. And because I think this audience is of a more general physics composition, not just astrophysics, I thought that might be interesting, but I'm not sure at the time I'll have to speak about it. So, the plan of my talk is, first of all, I thought I might talk, off, talk a little bit about Stephen Hawking. Would that be of interest? Because he was my PhD supervisor, and sadly he died just a few months ago. So I thought I might just start with a few memories of Stephen. Um, and I've even misspelled his name, I just added it, I'm sorry. Stephen Hawking. So if you're filming this, please <laughs> allow me to correct it later. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the, the early history of primordial black holes because I think <coughs> played such an important role in that, how they can form. Um, and I'm also going to talk about their possible role in explaining dark matter and indeed maybe even large scale cosmic structures. And it's these sorts of topics which have actually made it um, the subject a hot topic at the moment. And, um, and then I, if I've got time, I'm going to talk about primordial black holes or something between micro and macro physics. So let me start off then by um, talking about Stephen. Um, I started my PhD with Stephen in, in 1972. And I have to say, I, I'd just done my undergraduate degree in part three at Cambridge. 
And I'd never heard of Stephen when I began. But then my tutor, who was a physicist, Jeffrey Goldstone, he told me that Stephen was the brightest person in the department, the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics, which made me a little bit nervous. And, however, working with Stephen was, of course, a great, a, a, a great honour. He was not so famous in those days, but he was still very brilliant. And I have to say that because of his disability, I, was, I would spend quite a lot of time with him. I was sharing an office with him and lived in his house for a while. So I had quite an intimate relationship. So it wasn't the normal student-supervisor relationship. But that meant that I was very privileged because I could, I could talk to Stephen and, and get his great insights. And, and talking to Stephen for just a few minutes would, would sometimes give me far more insights than talking to most people for, for months. But I have to say that conversations weren't always insightful. I can remember one little, one occasion where I was having a conversation with Stephen. I just had an idea and I said, I explained this to Stephen and I said, Stephen, does this make sense? And then Stephen thought and for a minute and didn't say anything. And I was really impressed that I'd answer, asked a question which Stephen couldn't answer immediately. And then his eyes closed, and I thought, my goodness, Stephen's having to think about this really deeply. <laughs> but then eventually I discovered Stephen had fallen asleep. <laughs> and I still remember that, if ever I fall asleep talking to students, I remember that. But just to make it clear, Stephen was a brilliant physicist, but was only human. Now, this was the picture of Stephen when um, I began my PhD. I, in fact, I took that picture. And in 1974-75, he went to Caltech for a year. And that was a very special year. It was the year, this was the year Stephen discovered Hawking radiation. And uh, I was lucky to have a sort of ringside seat. But also, it was Stephen's first chance to get away from Cambridge. It gave me a chance to get away from Cambridge which is somewhat more cloistered than Caltech. And it was a really exciting time. Um, this is a picture of me with Stephen and our secretary. Um, this was the house we lived in. I lived with the family. I had an arrangement whereby I would help Stephen at home and even babysit the children. Um, in exchange, I wouldn't pay any rent, so that was a, a good deal. Um, this was the family, Stephen and his Jane and his, his two young children, Robert and Lucy. But of course, it was a really exciting time scientifically, and this is just a few, uh, I don't, maybe the resolution is a little bit too bad there. there there's uh, Stephen and me, Kip Thorne, um, Roger Penrose, Werner Israel, Bob Dickey, um, a few other, there are more people there, you can't probably resolve it, but there, for example, is, is, is Belitsky. Uh, uh, um, Belitsky is there, and Don Page, um, Jim Hartle, that goes for all of them, there's their seat in the middle. Steam was, of course, in a wheelchair, even in, in, in those days. Then the, um, there, there's a Brzezinski, who, of course, was a, who, who worked, wanted non domination and worked a lot with, with Kip Thorne. Um, and there is just a, a picture of, um, we used to have conferences for Steve where all his students would get together. And this was the 60th conference, and uh, all the students would get together behind Steve. And uh, I think that was the meeting where I uh, met Igor, Igor Novikov was present. But anyway, the, um, Stephen had his heroes. Um, he had Galileo as one of his heroes. And um, sorry, I didn't think to go from go backwards. Um, when I went to the Vatican, Stephen, in 1974, he was awarded a, a medal by the Pontifical Academy of Science, and Stephen insisted on going to see the, the recantation of Galileo in the archives. And uh, Stephen was born on the 300th anniversary of Galileo's death, so he obviously always felt a great affinity with him. And, uh, uh, his other heroes were Dirac, who he met on that occasion when we, the first time Stephen met Dirac was at this meeting. And uh, Stephen had been given this award. And he, he went up to Dirac and said, Professor Dirac, I would like to thank you for nominating me for this, this award. And Professor Dirac said, 
I didn't. I nominated somebody else, which is something only the right would have done. But, uh, but then he said, but I read your papers and I saw you were the strong candidate. Feynman, Feynman, of course, was at Caltech, and Feynman was like a god at Caltech. And when myself and Stephen arrived, the first thing we did was we went to Feynman's lectures. And then later on, Feynman would come to Stephen's office quite a lot to talk to him, and I would, I would be interpreting. Um, and then, um, of course, his other hero was Einstein. And I don't know if you know this, but Stephen died on the um, birthday of Einstein. So it was, it was always fascinating that Stephen sort of was born on the death day of his first hero, and he died on the birthday of his second hero, which I always thought was rather appropriate because Stephen, of course, was famous because of his singularity theorems for, for discovering that you have mysteries occur at, at the endpoints of, of trajectories. So I thought that was a rather appropriate coincidence. But anyway, I, I don't want to say any more about Stephen, but I, I'm sort of dedicating this, this talk to the memory of Stephen. Um, and I want to get on to primordial black holes. Do I need this, by the way? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, I'm assuming people know roughly what black holes are. So let me just explain, though, that if you have an object of mass n, that if it gets inside its short charge radius, then it will form an event horizon and form a black hole. And so what that means is that the density has to go like 1 over mass squared. So the smaller the black hole, the higher the density. And now, the black holes which we know exist, they're the stellar black holes, which form from stellar collapse, and they have a mass somewhere in the range of 100, 1, 10 to 100 stellar masses. There are intermediate mass black holes, which are somewhere between 1,000 and 10 to the fifth stellar masses, and there are supermassive black holes, which are in a mass range 10 to the sixth to 10 to the ninth stellar masses. And the there's lots of evidence for that. That is Cygnus X1, which is a binary, one of the first black hole candidates to be discovered. It's a black hole in a binary system. Uh, the evidence for intermediate mass black holes is somewhat weaker, but um, still pretty convincing. This is an ultra-luminous X-ray source, and the black hole is supposed to be about 500 solar masses. <coughs> and then in the centers of galaxies, we know our own galaxy's got a 4 million solar mass black hole in its center, um, but quasars are typically powered by 100 million solar mass black holes, and there are even black holes as large as 10 billion solar masses. And I would say the evidence for that is pretty well overwhelming. But, um, but the point is that all of these black holes are massive, so the, a relatively modest mass. But the point is, how you cannot form a black hole which is smaller than the solar mass at the present epoch. And if you go back to the early universe, the density goes arbitrarily high. In the Big Bang Theory, which I'm assuming everybody here is, is familiar with, the cosmological density just goes up, sorry about this, I keep going back to it. The cosmological density just goes like 1 over t squared where T is the time from the Big Bang. And just comparing the density of the, of the universe with the density of the required to form a black hole just tells you immediately that the mass of the black hole has got to be something like C Q T over G, which is the mass within the horizon. By the way, I'm using equations here because I'm not quite... Most people in the audience are physicists, that is correct. So I can use equations, can't I? I'm not, it's not a general to the general public to understand it. So this is uh, the, the mass within the horizon. And this mass range can be enormous. It can go from uh, the Planck mass, which is 10 to the minus 5 grams, if the black holes form at 10 to the minus 43 seconds, which is the earliest time. But if they're forming at 10 to the minus 5 seconds, which is uh, still relatively early, they can still have a, a, a mass of one solar masses. And the black holes which have a mass of which form a 10 to the minus 23 seconds after the Big Bang, I've got the mass of 10 to the 15 grams. And we'll see these are the ones that are operating at the present epoch. 
So the first thing to notice about primordial black holes is that they have a huge mass range. And that's what makes them so interesting. Um, now, the people sometimes say the first paper written on primordial black holes was by Stephen Hawking. It's actually not true, but this is the, this is, he sometimes thought of as the person who wrote the first paper. He wrote a paper in, in 1971 pointing out that primordial black holes would form in the early universe in the way I just described. But actually, his model at that time was one which turned out to be wrong. He, he thought they would be charged. He thought they, would, they could capture electrons and form atoms. He thought they could, they could get found in, in ionization tracks and cloud chambers. He thought they could form in the center, collapse in the center of the, form in, you know, collect in the center of the sun and explain the new, solar neutrino problems. So actually, almost all the reasons for which Hawking in, invoked primordial black holes turned out to be wrong. But it was still a, a really important paper. But actually, the paper which I want to highlight was the paper which was in <laughs> this really was the first paper on primordial black holes, and it was by Zeldovich uh, and Igor Novikov. And, but actually, this paper had a rather um, uh, ambiguous role in, in the subject, because what they showed in this paper was that if you formed a black hole in the Earth universe, the density and the pressure are so high that the black hole would accrete very fast. And it would accrete so fast that it, the black hole would grow as fast as the universe, so any primordial black hole today would end up having a mass of something like 10 to the 15 solar masses. And we know such black holes can't exist. And therefore, the natural implication of this was that actually primordial black holes didn't exist. Now, actually, I, I have a slide going, showing me what that argument was, but I'm going to skip that slide because I think, um, I should say, I'm giving a more technical talk on Thursday where I, can, I will be talking about some of these things in more detail. So, forgive me if I quickly go through, I'm going to skip the, um, the argument. Should I be skipping this? Is this going to be too technical for the audience? I'm, sorry? For anybody. For right, okay. So, let me go on to the next slide. I'm missing that one. Now, the first paper I wrote on primordial black holes, my first paper I wrote at all was with Stephen, and that was in 1974. And what we were able to show was that actually the conclusion of Zeldovich Novikov was actually wrong. Now, the point was the Zeldovich Novikov, oh my goodness, sorry, I'm not holding this. The Zeldovich Novikov argument actually did not allow for the expansion of the universe. It was not an exact relativistic calculation. It was perfectly correct as a Newtonian calculation. And what we were able to show in this paper was that primordial black holes would not grow very much at all. And, and so that was really good news because it meant there was no observational evidence against primordial black holes. Now, I remember that my first conference was in Warsaw, and in 1973, it was the IAU meeting in Warsaw, and my chairman for that talk was Igor Novikov, and Zelovich was there as well. And I remember being very nervous because I was going to give a talk saying, Zelovich and Novikov, two great physicists, were wrong, but their conclusion was wrong. And I remember being very nervous about this, but they were. Igor was my chairman, who was very delightful, and they were very kind. And I think the conclusion was correct. So that was my first meeting with, with Zeldovich and, and Novikov. And that, indeed, after that meeting, I came to Moscow. And that was my first meeting in Moscow. But anyway, scientifically, this was important because it meant that primordial black holes could exist. And then, um, again, I'm skipping this. Because it was realized that small black holes would exist, Stephen Hawking decided he had to start thinking about their quantum effects. And what he discovered was, of course, that black holes are not black at all. They have a temperature, 
and they can emit radiation if they're very small, and they can eventually explode. And this was his famous paper in Nature in 1974, Black Hole Explosions. And I, there's no, re no reason to read the, the abstract, because I think most of you are aware of this, this, this result. It's worth saying that actually, when Steam was working on this, that was when he visited Moscow in 1973, and spoke to Zelovich and, and Starobinsky, and he was partly motivated, he was partly inspired by the work on super radiance, for example, by, by Starobinsky. So I think the meetings he had, the talks he had in Moscow in 1973, I think even possibly in the, this institute, um, were, played an important role in this, this, this discovery. Now, this is his famous formula. Um, his, the temperature of the black hole is 1 over the mass, so for the sun it's 10 to the minus 7, that's in degrees Kelvin. And what was so important about this result was that it, it unified different areas of physics. It unified quantum theory, uh, general relativity, and, and thermodynamics. And, and that's why the result is so important. There is still no direct observational evidence for black hole evaporation or Hawking radiation, but almost everybody accepts it's true because it's so such a beautiful result. And, and John Wheeler once told me that just talking about this result was like rolling candy on the tongue. It was such a, a beautiful result. Um, I, sorry, I'm just this is advertising my own book, rather naughty, um, on quantum black holes, but notice the arrow goes in the other direction. It didn't play any role. It's just, um, we talk about that in that book. So, um, but what's fascinating about this is that even if primordial black holes never actually formed, it was important to think about them because that's how Stephen Hawking discovered Hawking radiation. So it shows in physics that it can sometimes be useful to think about things, even if they don't exist. But of course, it's much more interesting if they, if they do exist. Um, I have to say, one of the people in the audience Stephen gave the first colloquium on black hole radiation at Caltech, and I used to sit at the front and help him you know, give his slides. And one of the people um, in the front was Feynman. And I was told afterwards that Feynman had uh, drawn my picture on the back of his envelope. And I was really excited because Feynman was one of my heroes. And so I rang up his secretary and said, can I, can I um, have the, the picture which Feynman wrote? And she said, well, he's thrown it away into the garbage bin. So I said, can you get it? So she went through his garbage bin and she found this envelope. And uh, I like, it's got my picture and it's got his notes on Stephen's lecture and it's got some, even some Feynman. Uh, diagrams, and it now sits on my mantelpiece frame, so it's one of my prized possessions. Let me go into black hole evaporation in a little bit more detail. Um, the temperature of black hole is, um, as I said it before, it goes like one over the mass, and that means the black hole will evaporate entirely on a time scale which goes like a cube of the mass, and. Um, for the mass of the sun, that's enormously large. It's 10 to the 64 years. So you simply don't have to worry about this for something of the mass of the sun. However, if the, the black hole has got this magic mass of about 10 to the 15 grams, which means its size is something like a Fermi, then the lifetime is exactly the age of the universe, 14 billion years, and that means that the, the black hole will be exploding today. And so what was exciting was the question of, can we see these black holes exploding today? Because if we could see these explosions, the gamma ray burst, it would be evidence both for primordial black holes and for Hawking radiation. Unfortunately, it soon became clear that this was not likely. And the reason was that for most of their lives, these black holes are emitting gamma rays at about 100 MeV. And, and that means that the density of the black holes, this is in units of the critical density, cosmological critical density, has to be less than about 10 to the minus 8. So only a very small fraction of the universe can be in these black holes, else there'll be too much of a gamma ray background. And that meant it was unlikely that we would be detecting their, their explosions. So in a way, that was bad news. Um, but it's interesting, I make it, if you take a black hole, which is less than about the 
10 to the 26 grams, roughly the mass of the Earth, then its, its temperature would then be bigger than the temperature of the microwave background. So that is, I always take that to be the transition for quantum black holes. If it's, if it's smaller than the mass of the Earth, then it's hotter than the microwave background radiation. But if it's bigger than the mass of the Earth, um, it won't be evaporating because it's, it will be absorbing the background radiation instead. Um, now, I want to now put the discussion about black holes in a somewhat broader context. Now, this is my favorite picture. And I, I, I'll, I'll just explain it briefly. That it's, it's called the, the cosmic Euroboros. It's the, the snake that swallows its own tail. And it represents all the things we know about physics, all the physical structures that exist in the universe. So at the bottom we have, sorry, at the bottom we've got um, people, and as you go to the right, you get larger things like mountains, planets, stars, solar systems, galaxies, and then the universe itself. Um, as we go to the left, we have successively smaller things um, like ants, um, amoebas, DNA, atoms, nuclei and subatomic particles, and then you get down to the scale of M theory. So essentially, as you go in this direction, you're going all the way from the Planck length to the, the scale of the physical universe. And it's 60 decades of scale, so you can think of this as like a clock, where every minute is a factor of 10. And I love this diagram because it just summarizes all the physics. And also it shows the beautiful links between um, the micro domain on the left and the macro domain on the right. So th these links, for example, the same electric forces that provide sol hold solid objects together like planets is the same electric force which keeps the electron in orbit around the atom. The same strong and weak force which uh, operates in the nuclear, in a nucleus of an atom is what controls nuclear burning in the sun. The same uh, supersymmetry force, which is uh, probed with the Large Hadron Collider, for example, uh, is probably responsible, maybe responsible for the dark matter which we observe in, through observation of galaxies. The same grand unified theory, if forces which we speculate about at very, very small scales, are probably responsible for the fluctuations which generate galaxies. So, in some sense, this summarizes the law of physics, and it shows the beautiful links between the micro and the macro world. Now, the reason I'm showing this is because I want to show how black holes fit into this picture. So, I'm now going to put around this picture the different black holes that exist in nature by size, because remember, it's the size which is, which is represented in this diagram. So, this is more or less in the order in which they were in the order in which they were discovered. So we've got stellar black holes, intermediate mass black holes, the black hole in the Milky Way, black holes in quasars, in some sense the universe is a black hole. And then we the primordial black holes, if they exist, the terrestrial mass, lunar mass black holes, and the black holes which are now um, evaporating and the ones which are exploding when they get down to about 10 to the 10th grams, and then even the tank has black holes. And so, most people who study black holes, they really only tend to study a subset of these. They, they might study the stellar black holes, or they might study the black holes in the centers of galaxies. Primordial black holes, they occupy the entire left-hand side of this diagram, and maybe even some of the right-hand side. So that's what makes them so interesting. And we still don't know that primordial black holes exist, but, um, well, if, if God exists, he would be very cruel not to build in the rest of this diagram. Um, and uh, also the, um, I'm sorry, you, you have the division between the quantum and classical black holes at the bottom, and then you when you get to the top, you have the possibility of hard dimensions and things like that. You're in the domain of, of N theory as well. Um, but anyway, that's to put it in context. And now I want to actually um, talk about primordial black holes in particular. And um, 
So just to uh, this is just to put it in context, uh, primordial black holes form in the early universe. Supermassive black holes probably form after relatively late in the universe, but just after a million years or so. And then the intermediate mass black holes and the stellar black holes uh, are formed late. And uh, then there could even be black holes and accelerators if you believe in hard dimensions. I'll make a mark for that at the end. Um, let me now go, to, go to list this out. This is just a summary of all the various quantum and astrophysical effects of black holes over different mass ranges. But I want to miss out this slide because I'm um, taking a bit out of time. Um, remember, that the other theme of my talk is the link, black holes is the link between microphysics and macrophysics. But now let me return to primordial black holes. I've told you that in principle, primordial black holes can form because the density of the, uni of the universe is very high. But they will only form if you've got some particular mechanism. If the universe was completely uniform, no primordial black holes would form. And so the question is, how do they actually form? And the most natural way in which they would form is if they were in the homogeneities in the early universe. Density fluctuations, because we know density fluctuations give rise to galaxies, and uh, the same sort of fluctuations on a smaller scale could give primordial black holes. And in particular, if we believe in, in inflation, inflation could generate the in homogeneities that might make primordial black holes. Um, another possibility is that the pressure may have been reduced at some early time. So normally when the universe is, in most phases, the early universe has got high pressure, it's radiation dominated, but in some cases the pressure can be reduced and then black holes form more easily. And this was a, a subject which, again, the Russians um, pioneered, uh, my friend um, Sasha Polnareff and also Maxim Klopov, uh, I haven't put their names there, but they introduced this idea. Because black holes form more easily when the pressure is reduced. If there were cosmic strings in the early universe, which some people believe, then under certain circumstances those cosmic strings could form loops and then collapse to form black holes. And that puts constraints on the string parameter. Um, I won't go into the details of this because those of you who are familiar with the concepts will understand, but those who are, it would take too long to explain. But I just want to get across the idea that there are different mechanisms for forming them. You can also have uh, bubble collisions. You can have a phase transition in the early universe, which means that you can get bubbles of broken symmetry, and the bubbles can collide and form primordial black holes. Um, and again, you can even have whole domain walls forming and collapsing to form black holes. So these are, um, this again is a subject that Russian physicists have worked on. So those are the mechanisms through which they work, through which the, the primordial black holes can form. Um, my own first paper on the subject goes back to 1975, where I was interested in how primordial black holes can form from inhomogeneities. Um, now, I'm, I'm slightly worried I'm going to be getting too technical at this point, because um, I wasn't quite sure whether the audio... Most people I here are physicists, is that correct? So I will go through these equations, and if it gets too technical, I will just, some, just tell me and I'll stop. But, but um, so, because it's, it's such a simple idea, I, I, I want to explain. If you have an overdense region in the early universe, that overdense region will eventually stop expanding with the universe and it will recollapse. But it can only collapse into a primordial black hole if it's bigger than what's called, if it can collapse against the pressure, which is called the genes length. And that genes length um, is just root alpha times the horizon size, where P equals alpha rho is the, the equation of state. And it's very easy to show that that means that when the region comes inside the horizon, its amplitude must be bigger than this parameter alpha. And for example, if the early universe is radiation dominated, alpha is a third. So it's a very simple criteria. Now, you expect that the um, fluctuations in the early universe are going to have a Gaussian distribution. 
and they're going to have some um, root f mean square um, amplitude epsilon m, which is like the width of this Gaussian distribution. So you can see that you're only going to form primordial black holes from the, the tail of this Gaussian distribution. And then you can easily show from that that the fraction of the universe collapsing just depends on the amplitude, expected fluctuation amplitude of the horizon clock epsilon m, and it depends exponentially, exponential to the minus one over epsilon squared. Now, the point about that diagram, this equation, is it's showing you that only a tiny fraction of the universe is going to collapse into primordial black holes. And it's exponentially small. Um, and in those days, we used to think that the, the amplitude of fluctuations would be scale invariant, and that meant that the, uh, there would be the same fraction of black holes forming on every mass scale, so you would be able to predict uniquely what the, the mass function of the, of the primordial black holes would be. So that was the simple analytic prediction. Um, Oh, there was a, a reference to the clock of Palmaric work for the soft equation of state. But that was, of course, a very simple analysis, a very simple analytic analysis of the formation. Um, a very important paper um, came out, which was by Novikov, Palmaric, Zarabinsky, and Zeldovich, looking at the formation of primordial black holes in more detail. And they did numerical calculations. And this is, uh, again, I'm afraid this may be a little bit too technical for the audience, but basically they, they put in big perturbations into the early universe with a characteristic size and pressure gradient, and, and they, they basically analyzed under what circumstances the primordial black holes would form, and sort of confirmed the rough qualitative picture which I just described. So that was an important uh, paper of the development of the subject. I'm sorry, you can't read the diagrams very clearly, but I don't think I should talk about this in too much detail anyway. But they basically just confirmed that if the perturbation was big enough, um, it would form primordial black holes. Now the other point is that you can ask what fraction of the early universe can have gone into primordial black holes. And you can very easily show that the fraction of the universe going into primordial black holes must have been very, very small. Um, if we take the present density ratio of black holes, the black hole density, the microwave background density, the primordial black holes could dominate the density at the present epoch. But as you go back into the early universe, the black hole density goes up like 1 over r cubed, but the radiation density goes like 1 over r to the fourth. So you can show that this ratio goes smaller like the cosmic scale factor. And this means that if the black holes form at some time t, the fraction of the universe collapsing must be very, very tiny. And you can also express that in terms of the mass. So for example, if it's 10 to the 15 grams, um, uh, this ratio could be at most 10 to the minus 18. Only the PVH is the density of the black holes and the units of the crystal density. And the, um, we have we, lots of constraints on the value of this density parameter. For example, if the black holes haven't evaporated, they must have uh, less than the dark matter density, which is 0.25 in the cold dark matter picture. We've already seen that they're, if they're evaporating, they have to be less than 10 to the minus 8 because of the gamma ray bursts. If they evaporated in the past, they would have had lots of um, cosmological consequences. They would have generated entropy and affected Big Bang nuclear synthesis. And very early on, one knew um, one had strong constraints on the fraction of the universe going into primordial black holes as a result of their evaporations. And this is, a, a, again, that paper by Novikov et al. And, and what is plotted here is the fraction of the universe collapsing as a function of mass. And uh, it, the point is, we know the fraction collapsing is tiny. 
and that's associated, with, and there's a similar, I produced a paper in 94 which came to similar, rather similar constraints. And um, basically this, this is the density constraint, the gamma ray background constraint, the effects on big bang nucleosynthesis, and entropy, this is a very frank mass relic to the back so the point is we have really strong constraints on the fraction of the universe going into primordial black holes. But we know it's going to be tiny anyway, for the reasons I, I explained. Um, so now, since then, a lot of effort has been put into calculating the constraints on the fraction of the universe collapsing. Um, this is a diagram, I'm not, again, I'm going to skip this because I'm, I'm I think it's too technical, but this is looking at constraints on the collapse fraction. Sorry, well, let me just, let me just say that if you've got a constraint on beta m, that in turn puts a constraint on the, the amplitude of the fluctuation in the early universe. Um, because of the relationship between beta and epsilon. So I can turn that beta m diagram into an epsilon m diagram. Remember epsilon is the horizon amplitude fluctuation. And so, basically what we, we, we see from that diagram is our current observations only tell us about large-scale structure, the, the amplitude of the fluctuations on the very larger scales. We can see if we want to make primordial black holes, the fluctuations have to be much... Well, first of all, you've got a unique probe of the fluctuations on small scales, but you also need fluctuations to actually be much larger on small scales. So that's the first thing we learn, is that if you want to make primordial black holes out of fluctuations, you need to actually have a, a form which makes bigger fluctuations at small scales. Um, I'm going to skip this diagram, sorry, it's too technical. Um, I'm going to skip this diagram. I wasn't quite sure what the level of the audience was, so that's why I'm changing the cutting out some of the slides. But I want to say something about inflation. I think most people now are aware that most cosmologists think that the early universe went through an inflationary phase, which meant that it was expanding exponentially fast. And so what are the implications of that for primordial black holes? Well, the first thing is that primordial black holes formed before inflation basically just get inflated away. And we know when inflation actually, um, we have limits on when inflation could have been, and so any black holes um, which were less than a gram would no longer exist. The pro those black holes would have been inflated away. That's because the reheating temperature which is the temperature after inflation, we, we have upper limits on that. It must be less than 10 to the 16 GV, and that gives us a, a, a limit on the time of inflation ending. So we don't think any black holes less than the ground will still exist if you believe in inflation. But the point about inflation is that inflation generates fluctuations. And the fluctuation depends on the form of the potential, which is actually... Um, This is the potential associated with inflation. It depends on the scale of field, and that's the potential. And inflation occurs as the universe rolls down that minimum. But the point is, inflation generates fluctuations. And those fluctuations um, depend on the form of potential. And so those fluctuations could, in principle, generate primordial black holes. Now, there have been a huge number of papers written about inflation and primordial black holes, so I'm not going to try and review them here. I mean, essentially, if you have any theory of inflation, of which there are now 100 theory models of inflation, the first thing you do is to see whether it makes too many primordial black holes. And so I, I can talk about that in more detail in my lecture on Thursday, because it's more technical. However, I do want to, I want to advertise one important paper, and this was a paper which was, uh, I think, uh, 1970, 1970, uh, 1994, I think. And this was the paper by Asher Ivanov and, uh, and, and uh, 
Herschel and Zelsky, and Igor Novikov again. And they wrote one of the first papers, I think, on inflation and primordial black holes, and also proposed that the primordial black holes could make the dark matter, which is the theme I'll be referring to later on. And, um, and this was, again, using a simple scalar field model where you introduce some feature in the potential. There are many more complicated inflation models, but this is the one which is the simplest one to consider. Now, I now want to get on to the topic of, of dark matter. Because I, I focus mainly, I've spoken quite a lot about the evaporation of black holes, because black holes evaporation is such an important physical process. But actually, what's currently more interesting is the black holes that don't evaporate. The ones that are bigger than 10 to 50 grams. And that's interesting because people are interested in whether primordial black holes can make the dark matter. Now, we know there's lots of dark matter. We know that from observations of galaxy rotation curves and buses and things. But we don't know what the dark matter is. A lot of people think the dark matter is some form of elementary particle, what's generically called a wimp. But after 30 years, no one has found any evidence for wimps, either through accelerator searches or direct searches or indirect effects. And so people are getting a bit despondent about that. And, and so people are turning to other possibilities. And the most exciting possibility is primordial black holes. Because we do know that black holes exist. So you don't need to invoke any new physics. Um, and furthermore, there's been a lot of attention recently, I'll come back to later, is this time about you know, the LIGO detection of gravitational waves. The two coalescing black holes, there have now been five events like this. But the, the point is the mass of those black holes are rather large, larger than was expected if they formed from stellar collapse. So some people have thought that maybe these black holes actually have detected by LIGO were primordial black holes. And so, in some sense, the black holes might not only provide the dark matter, the primordial black holes might even explain the LIGO results. And this, um, well, this is a little uh, advert to encourage this idea. However, there's one problem with this. I've emphasized all along that the fraction of the universe which collapses into primordial black holes is very, very, very small. Okay? On the other hand, it is expected to be very small in any scenario. And so it does require fine tuning. For example, if you form your primordial black holes in the quark hadron phase transition, about one in a million of the universe can go into primordial black holes. One in a billion. Okay? And so that requires fine tuning. Nevertheless, uh, I think we have to take very seriously the possibility that the dark matter is primordial black holes. Um, why is this a, a, a popular suggestion? The first thing to realize is that the success of, one of the great successes of the Big Bang picture is it explains the abundances of the light elements through Big Bang nuclear synthesis. <coughs> but that only works if the density of the ordinary baryons, things we're made of, um, is about, is about 0.05, 5%, that 5% of, of the critical cosmological density. Now, visible baryons have got about 1% of the, that's the thing in stars and gas, have got about 1% of the critical density. Um, but the dark matter has got about 25% of the critical density. So that tells us two things. It tells us that there must be non-baryonic dark matter to explain that thing, but there must also be dark baryonic dark matter to explain that difference. Um, so we need both baryonic and non-baryonic dark matter. The baryonic dark matter is normally called machos, massive compact halo objects, and the non-baryonic dark matter is typically called wicks. Um, now, primordial black holes are actually uh, rather odd. They're, they're, they're non-baryonic because they're forming in the rate before Big Bang nuclear synthesis when the universe is radiation dominated. But actually, they have features both of wimps um, and machos. They're like wimps in the sense they're non-baryonic, 
But they're like nachos in the sense that they can be quite large and have astrophysical consequences. However, um, there are only a few mass ranges in which they can actually make up the, the dark mass. Uh, even, there are large mass ranges which are excluded by, for example, by gravitational lensing effects. Primordial black holes on the range 10 to 17 to 20 are excluded by the femtolensing lensing of gamma ray bursts. Now, uh, I, I won't try and explain femtolensing, lensing, it's a little bit complicated, but it's just lensing on a very, very small scale. Um, black holes in the mass range 10 to 26 to 10 to 33 grams, that's basically between the mass of the Earth and the mass of the Sun, they're excluded by microlensing of the large margin of the cloud, and above a thousand solar masses are excluded by dynamic effects. Um, but there are little windows at which the primordial black holes can provide the dark mass. There's the mass window in the asteroid range, um, and there's a mass window in the sublunar range, and there's a mass window in the intermediate mass range. So if, you, if you're asked the question, can primordial black holes make up the dark mass? Yes, but only in various narrow mass ranges. Now, I have to say that the, um, there was a time when there seemed to be positive evidence for primordial black holes. And uh, this came from microlensing surges for the dark matter. Um, the point here is that you're, we're in the galaxy and we can look at um, halo objects. This is a distant galaxy like um, the Andromeda Galaxy or the LNC and the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. And the point is, if there are any halo objects, they will lens um, and change the luminosity of the stars. And so that method can be used to look for halo objects. And the very first experiments, which were done in the 1990s, found evidence for machos which seem to have a mass of about 0.5 five solar masses. And that was tremendously exciting because that's the mass, it's very hard to see anything that small could be dark unless it was a primordial black hole. And furthermore, a primordial black hole of that mass would naturally form at the quark hadron phase transition. And so I remember being really excited and thinking, my goodness, this is it. These things really exist. The primordial black holes formed at the quark hadron phase transition that have now been detected. And uh, there was a reason to think they might form that, because possibly the pressure would be reduced, so you would expect that to happen. However, later on, it was found this wasn't really true. Um, at most 20% of the dark matter could actually be in these objects. So it looked as though these objects couldn't make up the dark mass. But it's still an interesting question. We still don't know what actually did cause those events. So these were the constraints on the current halo fraction. Um, as a function of mass. And uh, so this is a fraction of the dark mass as a function of mass, and everything above the line to basically exclude it. Um, that's the Eros and Matter with the two experiments. Um, this is a more recent version of the same diagram. Um, now, this diagram looks a little bit complicated, but basically, uh, this is just a paper I did just a few years ago with. Uh, Kuno and Sandstack, where we put together all the constraints on the F, which is the fraction of the halo in black holes, primordial black holes of a given mass. So this goes all the way down from 10 to the minus 17 solar masses to something like, so in terms of grams, it's going solar masses 10 to the minus 17 all the way up to something like 10 to the 40 or so. This is a bit hard to read. And basically, all of these shaded regions are excluded by various sorts of observations. Now, I don't have time to go into all of those, but basically this is the uh, gamma ray background from the evaporating black holes. This is the destruction of white dwarfs and neutron stars. This is the destruction of uh, lots of dynamical effects associated with the destruction of star clusters and wide binaries and things. And there's also accretion uh, effects but basically, anything in that diagram which is, which is colored is excluded. So you can see immediately that if you want F equals 1, which is at the top here, there are only these narrow ranges of masses which are allowed. And 
this diagram is uh, a bit cleaner, I'll get rid of the word. So um, basically, it, it confirms what I mentioned before, that there are really only a few windows as the intermediate mass window, intermediate, so that's something like 10 solar masses. There is the uh, sublunar mass range, and then there is this asteroid mass range. So really, that's just emphasizing what I said before, that if you want primordial black holes, um, they can really only be in three narrow, three narrow windows. There's also the possibility of plank mass relics, if evaporating black holes need plank mass relics, but I'm not going to get into that now. It's a bit of a stretch. Um, well, so which mass window is most plausible? And you'll find the theorists um, are split. There are people who, for example, want all the dark mass to be in um, 10 solar mass objects. This is a, a, a recent paper. All of these are in, theorists are invoking inflation. And so this is a particular example which gives you a peak at 10 solar masses. On the other hand, there are other theorists, the Japanese here, who've got a model where they want the peak to be in the sort of sublunar range. So you'll find the theorists are a little bit split as to whether they want to use the the, the, the lunar or the intermediate mass range window. But at least, um, in theory, you, you could have either. I personally favor the, um, the tensor mass, the intermediate mass one. Um, now, I mentioned before, what has made this topic exciting? is the discovery of the LIGO events. And I'm sure, assuming everybody is familiar with LIGO, it detected the coalescence of two black, black holes and the gravitational radiation from that coalescence. But the important point was, I mean, that was tremendously important because it was the confirmation of the existence of gravitational waves and of, primal, and of black holes. But the point about it was that the black holes were much bigger than uh, was expected. So if we have the, um, this is the mass, and in, in blue we have the, the black holes detected by uh, X-ray, X-ray binaries, and in red we have the black hole mass range associated with these, with these LIGO coalescences. And what you can see is that LIGO black holes are bigger than the black holes that we knew existed. This, this is a nice representation. Each of these little blue configurations represents the merger of two black holes into one big black hole. And it's not very legible, but you've got the mass on the right. So you can see these blue objects, based, and, they, and these purple objects are the accreting ones. The color is a bit different. So it basically gets across the message. The black holes detected by LIGO were bigger than expected, and therefore perhaps represents a different population. And really, there are two options. Um, one option is that the black holes were, were what we call population three. The first generation of stars gave rise to black hole remnants, rather than the black holes forming galaxies. But the second possibility is that they're primordial. And so the question is, really, are the black holes detected by LIGO actually primordial? And this is uh, among the LIGO team, it's probably a, a low probability, I mean, they, but they always refer to this possibility. But when I go to meetings of, of primordial black holes, it's almost taken for granted that primordial black holes. So it depends who you speak to. But, but in any case, it's the, comp the possibility that the, the primordial black holes could be explaining the LIGO events which has also stimulated interest in the possibility they make the dark mass. Some people have argued that if primordial black holes make up the dark mass, sorry, make the LIGO events, then they have to make up the dark mass as well. But, but other people have, have argued, no, you could still make the LIGO events with primordial black holes and only have a small fraction of the dark mass. So there's some ambiguity there. But I think that's what's, what's exciting. Um, now, um, Finally, I want to talk about another possibility, and that is the possibility that the primordial black holes could actually be even larger than I've talked about so far, and maybe generate 
cosmic structures. So I'll just, this is a recent paper I've written with Joe Silk, so I'll just summarize the, the basic idea. Um, the question is, what is the maximum mass of a primordial black hole? You remember I started off saying that the black hole, primordial black hole has a horizon mass, which could go all the way from 10 to the minus 5 grams to a solar mass. But actually, in principle, it could be even larger than that. And that's what I'm most excited about at the moment. Now, let me remind you that in black hole, in galactic nuclei, we have got black holes with a mass from 10 to the 6, 10 to the 10 solar masses. Now, those black holes, the traditional view would be they simply form after galaxies. The galaxies form, and then through the dynamic, some dynamical processes, black holes form at the center. But the fact is, we don't know that's really the case, because we see these really large black holes at a very early cosmological epoch, and it's very hard to understand how they could have formed that early. Um, and so that's given rise to to the suggestion, well, maybe the black holes in the centers of galaxies actually pre-existed the galaxies. And so that gives rise to the possibility, maybe, in fact, the, the, primal, the black holes in the centers of galaxies are themselves primordial black holes. Um, now, I always used to argue that there wouldn't be any black holes formed before one second after one second because of Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So I always used to argue there wouldn't be any primordial black holes bigger than 10 to the fifth solar masses because they would have to have formed after nuclear synthesis. But actually, I later realized that that really is a, a wrong argument because the fraction, remember the fraction of the universe going into such large black holes in one second is about one in a million. Remember that, I'll show that on an early slide. Well, really, if one of the millionth of the universe goes into primordial black holes, um, it's not going to have a big effect on nuclear synthesis. So in principle, you can have bigger black holes than that. And so in principle, if you have supermassive primordial black holes could, could generate, they would have to accrete, but they could generate the big black holes in the centers of galaxies. But more than that, in principle, if you've got supermassive black holes, they could actually generate cosmic structures. And this is what we talk about. They, they can generate it either through what's called the seed effect. If you have a, if you have a big million solar mass black hole, it can, it can gravitationally bind a much larger region, so it's like a condensation nucleus. Or there's another effect called the Poisson effect. If you have a lot of black holes in a region, you get a Poisson fluctuation. And so uh, we argue in this paper that, that, that in fact, big black holes um, supermassive black holes could have a really important effect on, on cosmic structure. If you look at the relationship between the mass of the galaxy and the mass of the, of the black hole, the central black hole, observationally, it's, it's, it's well known, it's a, a, more or less a, 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 a proportionality. The mass of the black hole is, is correlated with the mass of the, the bulge, and it's, it's more or less a straight line. And the seed effect naturally predicts that um, the mass of the bound region is going to be basically um, a thousand times um, the mass of the, the mass of the bound region will be a thousand times the mass of the seed. That comes out as simple gravitational instability theory. So one of the advantages of the seed theory is it naturally explains this, this empirical observation. And furthermore, um, it would also naturally predict the mass function of galaxies actually will turn out to have the Preschetta mass function, which looks something like that. And it predicts a characteristic called density profile. Now, I'm not saying, you know, because people who work on the standard cold dark matter pictures, structure formation, will argue that their picture works fine. But actually, uh, it does work fine on certain scales, but there are problems with the cold dark matter picture on, on, on small scales, on the scales of galaxies themselves. As, I won't, there's no time to go into that. And what we argue is that primordial black holes um, are, could be important for resolving those problems. So we're not saying the whole standard picture is wrong, but we're saying that primordial black holes produce a sort of spike in the power spectrum of fluctuations, which, which could be relevant. And uh, I, I don't have 
In ending, let me just say something about uh, the popularity of primordial black holes. Um, when I started working on this subject uh, way back in, in the 70s, you know, it was not only a small fraction of people worked in the field, and only a small fraction of people took it seriously. Um, and um, so I, I'm plotting here a sort of timeline the popularity, which I don't quite know what popularity means, because I've always been interested in but it means how many people write papers about it. So this was the, I haven't put the, the Zelda Milinovikov paper, which goes to 67, but, uh, but if we start at 71, which was in some sense the argument that they should exist, then that's the start of the subject. And then there was the interest in them falling from inhomogeneities, um, and then I haven't mentioned it, Crawford and Schramm were suggested that they can form a quark hydrogen phase transition. Um, by the way, what's nice about primordial black holes forming at the quark hydrogen phase transition? They have the mass of, about the mass of Jupiter, but also they're going to have the size of a football. Okay? And I quite like the idea that dark matter could be in football size black holes, but it's topical obviously with the, the football. We just had here in Moscow. But anyway, that, that was that. And then in 1993, there were claims to detect these objects through microlensing. And then, we, we, in, as I mentioned before, in 1997, they thought found these objects. Um, and then people thought they could form through the quark hydrogen phase transition. I sort of explained this in very excitement. But then, of course, it all went away again when we found the microlensing constraints that were actually ruling them out as the dark matter. And then uh, I mentioned the possibility that the dark matter could be either plank mass relics, which I've not talked about, or sublunar or intermediate mass black holes. Um, and then most but then some of those ranges are excluded by dynamical accretion effect, which I've talked about. But now we've got the LIGO results. So really what's exciting is that now in 2000 18, I guess, there really is an excitement in primordial black holes. And the, um, the measure of popularity is sort of rather vague, but this, this is more specific. This is a, 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 the publication rate of papers on primordial black holes. And so it started off in the 70s being very low. This is, I guess, the number of papers per year. But now you can see it's basically soared. Um, but it's preceding LIGO, but basically because of the interest in, in, in dark matter and, uh, and, the, and the LIGO events. So I think now the, the possibility that primordial black holes might... I mean, I've worked on it for 50 years, 45 years, and for most of the time I thought, well, maybe primordial black holes don't exist, in which case I've wasted a lot of my life. But now, ironically, as I retire, um, it seems that they're coming into into vogue again, so I find that quite exciting. But on the other hand, I have to say, if the dark matter turns out to be primordial black holes, all those thousands of people who work on WIMPs will be very annoyed, so I know I'm going to be very unpopular. So, but anyway, truth, truth is with that. So really, um, no, I've, I've got a whole chunk of my talk which I haven't given. I was at one stage going to talk about the links between black holes as elementary particles and the links between the macroscope, the micro and the macrophysics. But I've run out of time, so I'm going to stop that. So I'm just going to go to my final quote, which is a dedication to Stephen. Um, yeah. So this talk is dedicated to the memory of my friend and mentor, Stephen Hawking. He was a pioneer of primordial black holes. If they play any of the roles discussed in this talk, this may have been his most prescient. And important work. If people ask what Stephen's most important discovery, most people will say black hole radiation. And that's true. But actually, if primordial black holes exist, then his 71 paper will have been regarded, I would say, just as important. And in fact, by the same token, the paper by Zelda Vitinovikov and all, because I have to say, 
that Russian, what's why I'm so pleased to be giving this talk here, is that it's the Russian cosmologists played such a crucial role in the whole history of this subject, not only in 67 with the first Novikov's Elvish paper, but with a host of other uh, Russian cosmologists. I mean, I've only mentioned it, I've mentioned, of course, um, Asher, but uh, there have been many other Russian cosmologists who worked on this subject. And so I, that's why I'm so pleased to bring what I hope is good news that primordial black holes exist. So, um, Stephen, um, the last time I saw Stephen was at his 76th birthday, little birthday tea party. Um, there were only about a dozen people there. He was already very ill, um, and to be honest, he thought he would probably die quite soon. This, I gave him a little birthday present, which was the a Leaning Tower of Pisa, so, which of course links to Galileo, who did his experiments on gravity. Um, and so that was the last time I saw Stephen, and uh, I, uh, I then went to Japan for a month, and I was a bit worried that he would, he, he would die while I was away, but he didn't. But I got back and he died within just a few hours of my return, so there was some sort of consolation in that. Um, and then, this is a picture of Stephen when he became Lucasian professor, and this is the, actually he's beheaded, but this is Isaac Newton. And, um, who was the Lucasian professor before him. So Stephen also had the Lucasian chair. As I'm sure you've probably heard, Stephen had the, the great honor of being interred in Westminster Abbey. And his, and I was fortunate to be at the ceremony, it's very unusual to be interred in Westminster Abbey. Isaac Newton was interred in Westminster Abbey, and, and New, Stephen is interred next to Isaac Newton. And the other physicists who were interred there were Rutherford and Thompson. And it's a very, very rare distinction. Maxwell uh, and Faraday and Dirac have got plaques, but they weren't interred. So really, it's an amazing honor for someone to be buried, to be interred in Westminster Abbey. And it was a, it was a very, a very <coughs> special occasion. So, um, so I dedicate this talk to the memory of Stephen, and of course, to the hope that primordial black holes will turn out to be really important. Thank you. <laughs>